So I have to start with little apologies um, uh, for these talks. Um, uh, I um, I see as my audience uh, people that are uh, doing the internal practices, um, doing uh, some kind of wisdom tradition. So um, uh, I like to give the talk from that point of view. So um, sometimes people say, well, your talk doesn't make any sense. And perhaps <laughs> there's no wisdom there either. But I want, I always want to do the talk, not from just an educational, external, exoteric point of view, but from an esoteric point of view also. <clears throat> Title for the talk is, um, purposeful life. So um, that's uh, sometimes um, mm, the Vajra on a tradition, um, that's uh, like a compliment. So if uh, uh, we all like compliments and praise, Joan, but uh, usually Tibetan style, which I'm real familiar with and Japanese too, they're, they're not going to say you're doing a good job or you're a good practitioner. Um, in fact, I don't think uh, any of my traditional teachers have ever said that. Um, we're used to saying that in California. Good job. You know, thank you. They, it's very traditional say, I'm happy that you're leading a purposeful life like that. Um, you know, that it's wonderful now that you're leading a purposeful life. <clears throat> it's kind of a little different than just directly addressing, I think you're great. It little, feels a little different, right? It's, it's a encouraging and affirming, but it doesn't say you're doing a good job. Does it feel different? It feels different to me. Somebody says, you know, you're... I can see, or I'm happy that you're leading a purposeful life. Mm -hmm. So it's addressing that we're somehow actually engaged in the practice. <clears throat> so since it is uh, Mother's Day, I thought you know that this would be a good way to combine these two talks um, because um, the purpose um, uh, for doing the Dharma practice um, is to uh, give birth to this um, uh, blissful loving wisdom, you know, wisdom loving, I call it sometimes. <clears throat> Those who were fortunate to see Geshe Tenge be here um, yesterday and speak um, from Bodhicharya Vitara entering the way of the Bodhisattva, engaging in the way of the Bodhisattva, said, you, you must gain the wisdom. Sometimes we portray wisdom as, um, you know, kind of dry a little bit or exalted, um, impossible, but in our practice, uh, it's the purpose. It's what we're doing to gain uh, the blissful wisdom love. <clears throat> and particularly in the Tantrika Vajrayana tradition, uh, the blissful, uh, and in the Mahayana tradition, um, if we have to give form to uh, uh, Prajna Paramita, this uh, blissful wisdom love, what does Prajna Paramita look like? I don't think we have the drawing of Prajna Paramita that we can put up, do we? Yeah, so maybe that would be interesting. <clears throat> we have a graphic just on that. Yeah, yeah. Just after Heart Sutra. 
No, maybe, yeah. There's the Buddha, but we don't have uh, then the Arhat, then Chenrezig. We don't have. Oh, we're missing out. Yeah, then we have to get. Then. So, uh, <laughs> uh, in the actual paper copy, uh, Parshamar Paramita. She's holding a uh, right hand, a scepter, the Vajra, and in the left hand, the wisdom text, Prajna Paramita. So, um, uh, maybe you could look for that while we're going. So, Prajna Paramita, um, along with um, uh, a manifestation of Prajna Paramita, Tara is the mother of the Buddhas. The purpose is um, to be a mother that gives birth to the child, the Lusan Tantra, the, you know, the um, divine, we kind of translates as the divine child. So for Sagadawa next month, June 4th, hope you're here, um, we'll be uh, doing the ceremony. Oh, there you are. Does everyone see it? Yeah. Um, oh, very good, Elan. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's, that's a really nice, she's uh, in these wonderful mountains and um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Maybe we can just make that a regular part. Do that. <clears throat> oh, thank you. <clears throat> so at Sagadawa, we'll be um, outside. Hopefully, it'll still just be in the 90s. And... <laughs> or, <laughs> or do a ceremony uh, of uh, bathing the baby Buddha. <clears throat> so in Mahayana practice, we're kind of worshiping um, and giving praises to Prajna Paramita and Tara, but um, it's only in Vajrayana, the tantric path, uh, that we... Um, wish to become and st strive to become Prajna Paramita and uh, give birth to the Buddha like that. So I don't say we just stop it being like, we don't stop it being Tara or stop it being Prajna Paramita. We also, uh, you know, give birth to. In uh, fundamental Buddhism, of course, we're uh, we're seeing how uh, we give birth to problems, right? <laughs> we're fundamentally looking at, okay, uh, you give birth to problems through grasping and through ignorance, right? We give birth to problems that way through our clinging, ignorant clinging to impossible situations. Um, and sometimes the idea is like, well, just don't give birth anymore or don't take rebirth, right? So in uh, strictly monastic style Buddhism, you don't, you know, monks or nuns, you don't give birth, right? There? Yeah. <clears throat> Except when monks and nuns in India became tantrikas, and um, then they uh, still weren't having um, human children, but they were uh, instructed to uh, give birth to uh, the Buddha through uh, manifesting um, the awakened heart, the divine child. <clears throat> but some people actually, uh, we actually do produce children. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, my teachers, I was really delighted in children and um, uh, suggested that uh, 
if you want to really become a practitioner, um, you have to um, uh, regard um, your friends and your family as your own children and be a good parent. So one of my teachers described um, um, I'll tell a little story. So um, um, when I was studying Zen with Sasaki Roshi, I mentioned bef maybe before that um, uh, I had the temerity to invite him over to my parents' house for lunch. <laughs> Looking back, I was I, I don't know what was I thinking. You know, it's totally different worlds. But um, <clears throat> uh, at lunch in a, in a very ornate dining room, my mother asked Roshi, um, um, how, very directly, "How do I know uh, if you're enlightened?" I've told this story right before. He <laughs> said, "You don't." <laughs> But um, my mom, fortunately, like, didn't give up there, you know. Some people would, right? You know, that would be a little intimidating. So she says, well, what is enlightenment? So what do you think he said? Someone give it a try, like, you know, like... <laughs> Okay, you're waiting for me to tell you what he said. You know, my teacher used to tell these stories over and over again, and now I get it because I, I didn't remember anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, it's hard. I've got cognitive slippage. It's okay. We can just like... Uh, so if you're enlightened, you regard all beings as your children. Okay. Hard, right? It's interesting. It's a little different than saying, you know, mother. So in our tradition, if we want to generate uh, bodhicitta, uh, the uh, spirit of awakening, we uh, it's very classic to develop bodhicitta based on uh, your mother. So you remember the, with gratitude, uh, all the difficulties your mother went through um, to give birth, all the difficulties of just being married to some guy or something, all the you know, difficulties of raising. Um, and then you contemplate that your mother was uh, uh, also had suffering, right? Or illness or sickness. And you combined the, gratitude with the overwhelming need to relieve of her suffering. The best way, you know, and then then we contemplate, you know, I want to relieve uh, my mother of suffering, but I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> or I, I don't have the necessary tools um, or insights or wisdom, so I must gain some wisdom to do that. And then we contemplate uh, you know, that life is extremely short uh, or short. So we must gain that wisdom quickly. And then we kind of, what what would be the absolute best wisdom to actually, so that's the wisdom of being Buddha, completely unexcelled, complete enlightenment. So based on this progressive meditation, uh, we developed the bodhicitta, the um a strong wish to become Buddha in order to relieve ourselves and all mother sentient beings. <clears throat> so uh, that is like um, uh, a causal uh, kind of approach, right? We're, we're trying to cause bodhicitta to arise and um, reflect on, um, you know, our mothers and the suffering that way and that we must do everything we can possibly to relieve. Um, but once then, well, let's say we do that, okay? <laughs> like that. So uh, then what happens? Then uh, the resultant is that 
uh, we, we see uh, phenomena as like our children, like that. Now, by this time, we've gone through Dharma parenting class. So, of course, we're wonderful parents, right? But um, the uh, 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 we in Vajrayana, we have this kind of dyad of mother and child. Uh, and father's in there too, by the way. It's father's like father, mother, and mother, mother. So um, it isn't just we want to become mothers, but we also are willing to give birth to children because that's difficult. It was interesting yesterday. So um, uh, Geshe Tenge was here, give it like really a complete tour of the whole place. <clears throat> And uh, uh, and I said, to, now I'm going to show you the Tara Shrine, um, which is a little bit unique. Um, I said here we have uh, based on uh, my Tarama vision, you know, so uh, of a Tara Madhana, you know. And what's interesting, he got, he got it. That was very interesting, because that's the if I'm sure everyone here has seen the Tara Madhana, which I'm looking at right now, so. That you, there's nothing else on the whole planet that looks like that. I've never seen. I've never seen, you know, so Tara offering, you know, like holding up the baby Buddha, right? So, like, he got it. That's interesting to me. Very interesting, profound, you know. So, it isn't just that we want to be Tara or Prajna Paramita, uh, but uh, Tara is like manifestation of Prajna Paramita, but that we also want to give birth and, um, you know, nurture the uh, child. So um, <clears throat> that's why with my close students, I say, you know, like Tantra is like um, really um, uh, basically uh, a fertility practice <laughs> like that. Um, then if you think of it that way, then it, it um, makes sense. So um, at first we have to clean up our act and kind of follow um, the way of restricting our idiotic activity, right? So we decide we're not gonna do any harm, right? That's, that's why the precepts, when we take refuge are a little bit on the negative side, like don't be a jerk. But uh, then gradually we develop some love and kindness and openness in the Mahayana. And then finally, we're ready to, um, uh, you know, bring uh, wealth to the world. We're ready to celebrate uh, phenomenal existence. <laughs> Use Geshe uh, Tenge's uh, words. Um, and uh, what is it? We, we want to have a completely enjoyable, uh, fertile life, right? We do want uh, the earth to like be healthy. We want human beings and the animals and the plants to be healthy, you know. So it, it's uh, a complete um, saying yes, right? So um, this uh, big yes, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, finally culminated in India, the last Tantra discovered, um, the Kala Chakra Tantra, that um, we'll do Kala Chakra practice this afternoon is, is like the big say yes to everything, it's, which is totally outrageous, right? <laughs> so um, that's, that's complete, uh, that's totally completing um, the fertility right, you know? Um, <clears throat> uh, this is, I'll tell another Zen story, so a little story. So uh, uh, when uh, uh, my former wife and I were leaving the Zen monastery, we, we hadn't been married yet. We were like two Zen students um, driving off. Um, she was Roshi's attendant, and I was, I like a clean windshield. I don't know. Have you ever driven in someone's car with a windshield that's really dirty? It just bugs the crap out of me. I don't, why don't you just clean it, you know? 
So like, just go to the gas station and get the squeegee. So, but, um, you know, I, I was doing a little bit of my OCD thing and uh, uh, Suzaki Roshi stopped very zenny and goes, you know, if you clean the windshield too much, you won't have any kids. <laughs> we weren't even married. We were, we were just kind of going off on an errand, you know. <laughs> yeah. So um, there, there's there is a side of Dharma where we do have to purify uh, the mind. Um, and then, uh, but we also, you know, prepare the ground, really. But then um, we have to um, give birth to something um, because uh, uh, what we describe sometimes as Dzogchen, completion meditation, is the just show me world, right? Show up world. What do you got for me? Where's your child? Did you bring your kids? You know, where? what? What are you manifesting? What are you giving birth to? Um, <clears throat> it's not a static situation. So um, I'd like to stop here, you know, and my um, purposeful ramblings for Mother's Day and see if we can have some kind of discussion about um, mothers and kids and giving birth to divine children and little Buddhas and um, have fun. Maybe um, somebody has a microphone. Yeah. Uh, Loma, can I ask you a sort of a basic question? Uh, just Don't make cause... it too hard. I'm, I'm kind of like, <laughs> not too hard for today. All right. Uh, okay. Well, this came up uh, for me in some of Jada Rinpoche's teachings earlier this week also. Who, and I realized who's teaching? Jada Rinpoche. He's been teaching Mahamudra. Oh, okay. Nanda, and I realized that maybe I didn't have a good definition of this. And so I'm going to try one out. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between sutra level and tantra level. And sort of what I came up with was that sutra is uh, just sort of going outward, right? Your practice is going outward. And tantra level is first inside, then outside, which maybe makes sense with your description of birthing in a way. But I don't know if that's accurate in a felt sense um, a mental sense kind of generally in the Tibetan tradition um there's uh a distinction made between the um uh teachings uh the level of teachings that the buddha gave so um what's called sutra sutra means discourse uh, the sutra level would be teachings that um, pretty much everybody could understand whether you were doing any training or practice or not. Like, even if you're a complete idiot, we should be able to notice that things change, right? Like, common, you know, but even we ignore that because we're idiots. But, you know, if it's common, it's it's something we could maybe even all agree on, if we, at least through logic and through just shared experience. Like sutra level would be like, life is hard, stuff like that. Tantra level is um, uh, spoken to those students and people who um, have to have done some inner work or had certain experiences for it to make sense, right? You could call it just having certain experiences as kind of, uh, you know, um, Kansu Rinpoche used uncommon, right? Uncommon experience. So, uh, so generally uncommon experiences, you know, are, are internal, but uh, not necessarily, right? So we could say, um, you know, they, they kind of merge. It's not totally separate. Um, like, um, generally, uh, who knows? Things may change. It's a weird world. But generally, it's women that have given birth to other human beings, right? 
but there's a whole half, otherwise known as conventional men, who aren't able to give birth. So even though it's common, we could say we understand birth, we're not, we're not having the experience. So, uh, but sutra level is generally concerned with talks that, um, uh, you know, and almost anybody, if they're interested, could could understand. Tantra is um, for uh, is addressing those who uh, have had uh, certain experiences or are interested in having certain experiences. So, but they they do intersect. So, um, I haven't had the experience like. A, jumping out of an airplane and doing, you know, skydiving. But a lot of people have, you know, and I haven't had that inner, you know, but it has to be an inner experience too. You can watch people skydive, but, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's a little different if you actually do it. Is that true, Autumn? Is that true? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when we're saying sutra, inner and outer experiences or common and uncommon experiences, then uh, the, there's obviously an intersection because if we're doing tantra practice of your uh, a certain kind of experience and no one else is going to share it, that that's kind of a drag, right? So, um, uh, in a sense, when we start sharing our inner experiences, um, then uh, you know, something happens. An example for a shared is, of course, pain, you know? So we all know pain, but, you know, uh, it's weird. You can be sitting next to somebody in a lot of pain, um, but personally, we're not feeling the pain. We might pick it up emotionally, but we're not actually feeling the pain. So it's common and uncommon at the same time. It's like that. But generally, Tantra is geared toward uh, stimulating... Um, uh the uh felt lived experience um that's uh not cannot be captured in uh just words or uh concepts right has to, has to, has to be experienced it's the half has to be experienced world not merely the world of um logic or metaphor or um uh inference like that yeah thank you good question i'm just holding the mic for other questions so far um so when you said uh, when you're creating a problem or difficulty, treat it like you're birthing it. So are you saying to love that problem or difficulty unconditionally like you would your child? So that's an interesting question. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're giving birth to, um, uh, you know, creative, uh, alive and wisdom things, but we're also giving birth to idiotic things too, right? So um, in both cases, um, we ultimately apply wisdom love to both, right? But um, from, from the standpoint of continuing activity, we uh, have to apply um, a form of wisdom called prajna. So, uh, which means uh, wisdom that shows discrimination or is able to whoops, compare and contrast things, okay? So um, I was happy when uh, the, uh, or interested <laughs> when the, um, the translator Shire was here yesterday. Didn't even know he, you know, is given the, you know, kind of maybe that totally correct pragna, you know, very strong, you know, um, <clears throat> American Sanskrit, <laughs> like that. Uh, so there's jhana, um, which the Tibetans translated as yeshe. So those people who have taken refuge with me, uh, you're in that yeshe lineage, the um, 
jhana lineage. So this yeshe is completely uncontrived, non-conceptual, direct awareness, where um, prajna being uh, has an element of discrimination. You have to say, well, this will lead, this will lead to good results, and this will lead to not so good results. But the two, the two uh, wisdoms work together. Of course, you know they're not totally separate minds, but one is um, completely. Um... <clears throat> then we have uh, that interesting thing called, uh, you know, prajna paramita, you know, prajna that's gone beyond prajna. So we won't get in scholarly debates, you know, but. Um, Sometimes it said that, you know, the prajna that's gone beyond uh, is uh, in reality this completely uncontrived awareness also like that. But every day prajna is very important, you know, just saying uh, like th this is going to lead to positive uh, effects and this is going to lead to negative effects. So, um, in Buddha Dharma, we don't, um, we never say just do whatever. <laughs> so uh, even though we, that would be a misunderstanding, just just do whatever. So we have a certain karmic makeup and a certain body and a certain energy system. That, um, if we distort it, we're going to end up in suffering. But if we go, if we harmonize with it, then we won't. So the, the two wisdoms have to work together. So some uh, there's sometimes some discussion about when do prajna and jnana um, uh, work together or they work a bit separately from the exist. What I liked about Vishikenge um, today. Um, well, this is this is. Uh, this is another interpretation, or this is a dispute, you know. So that's how, you know, um, I like to run the um, Buddha Dharma study program for the scholar practitioners that are willing to go through that. It's like we're, 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 we're stating something, but we're also willing to say, well, others, others see it a little differently. You know, it's nice to have that open mind and say, well, you know, um, this, this is the way we see it, or this is one way to see it, or maybe even things is right, but other this we're willing to entertain. Like, yeah, people, there, there's arguments or um, not fierce arguments, but there's other um, ways of looking at the same situation. So, um, uh, you know, when you have a really good scholar, um, you know, particularly Lurampa Geshe scholar, then you know you you can find that. So um, my own teacher is Lorampa Geshe scholar. So Lorampa <laughs> I'm just going off tangent, but hopefully you, useful. So regular Geshe, you're just doing an examination in front of your own people, your own monastery. But um, Lorampa Geshe is you have to go to all the other monasteries who don't know you and aren't particularly on your side. Um, you have to also debate with them and 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 work it through to be Lorampa Geshe. So um, this is the way to do good Dharma saying, well, this is if you can't, if you only know one way and you only you don't know what others say about a situation, you're not considered a full practitioner. We have to also um, um, know how uh, other people do things um, uh, when when I'm practicing with um, Robert Nakashima, my martial arts teacher, he's very fond of saying, well, you, you've got to how to do it wrong. <laughs> and you must know how to do it wrong too, to do it right. So that's wonderful. I think he's making himself feel better because um, I may never get it totally right. But in real scholarship, we're looking at different points of view simultaneously without getting freaked out. Yeah, good question.
I'm not seeing any more questions. Like Sometimes that. when there are no questions, like it means that the the lecturer and the audience have kind of attained complete maha samadhi, you know, and everybody goes, we got it, so shut up, you know, we got it, you know, and, or we agree, you know, um, that's, uh, that's actually the Indian way in Buddhism. So if everyone's quiet, it means they agree with you. Um, whereas if they're still asking questions and disputing, then you, you have to carry on. <laughs> That's nice. Omo Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi